I suppose it's a better start. Um, if you can remember many moons ago, it was my first lecture, and it was on um, boom and bust society, and that was more economic theory. So this time I decided to go for more current affairs, things that are in the news. At the moment, nothing's really dominating the news more than the issues in the Europe, in the Eurozone, and particularly focusing on Greece and the financial situations their country's experiencing. So um, I thought, rather than doing another lecture on economic theory, where it's all good and well studying these theories of different economists throughout the years, but if it can't be applied or if it's not working in the current situation, then it doesn't really seem sensible to study them in a lecture style like this. So I thought, especially now, with um, the situation potentially coming to a close, I thought it was quite a good time to do a lecture on the problems in the Eurozone. And um, I'm just going to start by talking about how countries in fact borrow, because the whole situation in the Eurozone, the problems that are occurring, have come about because of government debt and they're essentially borrowing too much. Now, um, the ways that a country borrows, or a government borrows more specifically, is um, quite different and slightly more complicated than just individuals going to a bank, trying, uh, getting a mortgage or a loan, repaying that over a certain period of time with a certain interest rate. Um, there are similarities, but the main difference um, comes after the actual loan has been made. Now, um, a government can tends to borrow money when they run up a fiscal deficit, and as you all know, that means when they spend more than they bring in through, through tax revenues. And um, this occur, when this occurs, they can go to various financial institutions, including banks and banks from their own country, banks from other countries, or just other financial institutions, and they get a loan by issuing things called government bonds. And in this country, they're called specifically gilts. And these are essentially promises of um, money being repaid. So a government will give these bonds to a bank. In return, the bank will give the country money to a value of that bond that's been decided. And then that money will be repaid over an um, agreed upon interest rate over a certain amount of years. And because of um, countries being supposedly quite risk-free locations for giving loans, they tend to have quite low interest rates for this, um, these repayments. So it tends to be quite economically sensible to um, make big loans for a country because of these low interest rates they have to repay. And now, that's essentially where the similarities end between individuals borrowing and countries borrowing. Because this is when something called um, credit default swaps can be bought. But, and these are essentially um, when a country borrows from an investor or a bank, these banks can then purchase these credit default swaps. And these are essentially insurance on the debt that's been bought. Um, and it's effectively, if a country is unable to repay their loans to the investor, it will trigger these, it's called triggering, it will trigger these credit default swaps whereby the insur person who's insured the loan will be forced to buy the bond off of the investor or the bank and so they'll get receive the bond for a certain value which will be paid to the investor and um, this is another very big important issue with um, the current problems in Greece around credit default swaps and um, I'll come to these later again when um, talking about the recent things in Greece that have happened um, so that's basically how um, governments borrow and um, Without being able to borrow money, a country's economy essentially cannot run. A government, if, they, if they're cut off from being able to borrow money, their economy will just fail, and it's pretty short term with um, their borrowing. If they can't, if they have a week's period where they are, un, are unable to borrow money, um, it's likely they'll fall, uh, default. And um, the reasons for this is because by the time, once they start borrowing, it's a vicious cycle in the way that a country will borrow money, rack up a debt to finance their fiscal spending, but then they'll continue to build and build on this debt, and sometimes it can get to the point where they're si simply borrowing money to finance their repayments. And once a country gets to this point, that's when problems start occurring, like in Greece. Um, so now I'm going to move on to specifically the problems within Greece that have been occurring. 
And as far back, um, or tomorrow's from, from the readings I've been doing, the problems all really started in 1992. Does anyone know why that year in particular? What happened in 1992? The army? No, no. Track, um, the doctor of the year, quit the doctor of the year. Yeah, Maastricht, Maastricht Treaty in 1992. And um, this is effectively when the EU was set up and it came into uh, force in 1993. And this was the setup of the EU and the beginning of the Euro single currency and monetary policy and uh, union over Europe, well, much of Europe. And there were several guidelines put in place in this um, Bias Treaty to sort of govern the economics and the financial situations of any countries within the EU. And um, the first of these was concerning government debt. And it was that no country can have a higher than 60% debt level as a percentage of their GDP. And the second was to do the budget deficit, which is how much more government spends than takes in. And this was to be no more than 3% of um, GDP as well. And now, it's quite interesting when looking at these figures because at this point, only one country in all of Europe actually met these criteria and that was in fact the United Kingdom who didn't even want the Euro. So it's quite interesting, even as far back as then, how they set out these guidelines and they didn't really have any interest or any uh, option of following through with these targets to be strictly followed. Um, with their 3% budget target, budget deficit target, they did include that there, um, there was allowed to be temporary excesses over this 3% mark. But, as I'll explain later, these weren't really stuck to these targets. Um, um, specifically for Greece and these targets, as far back as the mid-90s, when they joined the EU and the Euro, well, they didn't join the Euro just then, but when they joined the EU, they sort of um, experienced quite a rapidly growing economy because of their ability to borrow money at low interest rates thanks to the strong, um, strong German economy and other factors in the EU enabling them to borrow, large, borrow large amounts of money. And this triggered them developing a policy of wrapping up a very large budget deficit. So they thought, oh, we can borrow money at low interest rate, so we're going to spend it. And that's exactly what they did. And in fact, by 2009, they in fact had a 15% budget deficit, which means they were adding massively to their government debt each and every year. And then if you take this back and look at the target of the EU, which is 3% budget deficit, if they're on 15%, it already begs the question, why were they allowed to get to this situation? Why were they allowed? Because back in 2009, no one was, Greece wasn't on the front page of every newspaper every other day, like it is at the moment. It was sort of a backstory. It wasn't too much in the news. It wasn't too much in the public eye. And yet they had overdone the EU target by five, five times. Now, it just um, confuses me somehow, uh, to some extent, that the Europe's leaders would allow for 10 years and more, the Greece's government and their spending policy to allow them to get in such a deep situation where their deficit is such a huge amount and seems like no way of getting it reduced. That's just on the deficit side. Now, if you look at the Greece's um, government debt, they in fact had, um, because of their rapidly growing economy and their huge spending, their government debt in fact has been above the 100% mark since the mid 90s. And in 2009, it reached 113% of GDP. Now again, consumer target is 60%. Again, it makes you wonder why they're allowed to get to this point. Why before 2009, which is when Greece became more and more high profile in terms of a dangerous country, in terms of the economy, why was it allowed to get to 2009? Why did it become a problem then? Why was it not first addressed in the mid, late 90s when it, could, it would have been a lot easier to solve the underlying problems that caused them to have a 15% deficit and over 100% debt. Um, and which, by the way, is um, they're at 2009, their 113% amounted to over 300 billion euros of debt. Um, then, because of this, because of their worsening debt situation and the fact they were continuing to add to it uh, at 15% GDP, um, Go, um, Greece's government debt and their bonds were downgraded by financial institutions. And what this essentially means, there are three main um, rating agencies, I think Stanley's, Morgan's, uh, S&P's, Morgan's and Fitch. Uh, 
and these essentially rate government's debt on how risk-free it is and how likely it is to be repaid. And it's all very complicated, the short-term and long-term bonds they use. But basically, AAA is the best, and it goes gradually down from there. And so, for instance, the UK and France have AAA rating. That used from a few weeks ago, it might be months now. Uh, there was a big thing because the US was downgraded one by SMBs. I think it was them. And um, yeah, basically, if a financial institution downgrades a country's debt, as they do with Greece in early 2010, it's basically a sign that their debt is it's unlike, well, it's less likely that they'll be able to repay all their loans if you, give, if you loan them money. And this is quite a worry for governments if their debt starts to be downgraded because, as you know, speculation can have huge impacts in markets. And just, just a small rumour can lead to the downfall of entire businesses. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> going back to the point on the, how the years of um, European leaders allowed Greece to go on, do you, has any country ever been taken out of Europe? No. To society. So do you think it's not just that... It was quite, it's actually quite a taboo, the whole... Yeah, exactly. Is any country going to leave the Euro? Will Greece be the first? So politically, it's not really that possible to eject a country, a country from the no. Euro? No. Yeah, it would, be, it would be difficult politically to just say, right, you're not in the Euro anymore. But what puzzles me, why put those targets in place if there's no ramification? This, what puzzles me? I'm not saying, right, your budget deficit's 15% or whenever, whenever it got above, let's say, 5 because... 2% that seems like a temporary excess. If it was above 5% for two years, I'm not saying, right, it's been at that level, you're now out of the euro. Um, that would be quite a silly way of dealing with it. But it's the fact there were no ramifications. There wasn't any, right, now we bring in some austerity measures. Now you need to start dealing with the inherent problems in the country that are leading to this deficit. But why would it be a silly way of dealing with it if it kept every country meeting their time up? I suppose that's yeah. more of a yeah. You overset the mark, you're out straight away. It would, in a way, lead to... More strict guidance. It's weird that that has not been done. You did ask the um, rhetorical question earlier about why didn't they do anything about it? Why do you think they didn't do anything about it? Did they think they were worried about seeming too harsh or just didn't think it was that much? Yeah, I think just simply because, um, well, when I say Greece's deficit, they weren't seeming to the target, it seems that I'm picking on Greece a bit. That's simply because it's the focus of my lecture. There there were loads of very few countries, in fact, met the criteria. when Greece joined the euro, I think it was 2000 or 2001, they actually joined the single currency. Um, there were several years, throughout the 90s, they wanted to join the euro. And um, basically, whenever it, when it first came in, they wanted to join the euro. And um, they weren't allowed to because they weren't meeting these targets. But then it got to the point where so many countries who wanted to join weren't meeting these targets that Europe's leaders essentially just gave in and said, fine. Greece, we understand no one else is meeting these targets, so there's no reason for you not to join. I think it's just that they brought in the, the, the whole underlying problem here, to some extent, is that the euro was brought in too quickly, and they rushed economic union without political union. And the fact they were so keen to bring in the euro quickly without actually ensuring maybe just France, Germany and the UK at first, build a really strong currency and then slowly bring in other countries once they've met the targets. They just did a massive, um, loads of countries joining straight away and this sort of meant that they could, couldn't focus as much on individual countries and the targets they're reaching or not reaching in this case. Have the targets been static since they started so have they not changed? No, they've so consistently been 3% budget deficit since they've been there. So why not change the target to something realistic? And then... Well, why? Equally with that, why set a target if you're just going to change it if someone doesn't meet it? There's no point saying six percent debt. Oh, half our countries have got ninety percent. We'll change it to that. Because then, like you said, well, you got to have a, yeah, you got to draw a line somewhere, and you got to have at least a target that you want to be met. And equally, there's no point setting a target if you're not going to bring in ramification if it's not met. So this is what I mean. It's just complete confusion. Why? This is what confuses me. Why did they bring in the targets and then either not change them or not? enforce any ramifications when they're not met. It seemed a bit pointless. Is any country in, the, in Europe meeting targets? Um, yes, by 2010, I was on the Czech Republic and Ooh. one other. <laughs> Czech Republic and one other had less than 3% budget deficit. So, so no. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really not, it's like very, very few countries are meeting these targets.
So yeah, as I said, it looks like I'm picking on Greece a bit, but that's just because it's focusing on lecture. But yeah, very few countries in Europe actually are meeting these targets, which does make you wonder why put them in place at all, and why not bring in ramifications when they're not met. But I'll carry on if that's, if that's right. <laughs> um, right, where is that? But yeah, the downgrading of um, Greece's debt. Now, the big problem, as I said earlier, if a government is unable to borrow money, um, they, the economy can't function, they can't make payments, they can't, fiscal spending just stops. And this is quite an immediate thing from not being able to borrow money to um, failing as an economy. Like when the governor came in, he was talking about how his conversations with the got um, head of the Royal Bank of Scotland saying, I can't borrow for three months, I can't borrow for a month, I can't borrow for a week. And that's quite similar with um, a country's government. It's sort of very short time. Once bad can move to worse very, very quickly. If they can't borrow, it means they can't repay what they already owe, which means they have to borrow more at higher interest rates. And that's what we're going to move on next. The, what's the actual real um, quantitative effects of a government's debt being downgraded and the first of these is that interest rates on their debt will shoot up. Like when an individual borrows money they have to pay interest on it, um, a government has to as well but it's usually a lot lot lower. And just to um, put some figures in, in 2007 Greece had to pay interest of 1.7% on their government bonds which is very very low. But that's the same, that's very standard for countries to pay very low interest. By the end of, by the beginning of 2011, they were paying 24% interest. Now when you think that's, I think it's something like 15 times more interest on their loans that they have to repay, and yet their deficit is not reducing. So they're borrowing more money and having to repay even more, and it just looks like there's no sign of it slowing down because of their deficit remaining so high, and they're now having to repay so much more money this is one of the severe problems for Greece at the moment. And then the second um, quantitative figures is to do with um, credit default swaps. And as I said, this is the insurance of borrowing debt, uh, borrowing of a country borrowing money and the loans that they produce. And credit default swaps, um, I think it's not like in Greece in 2006, for every 10 million euros they borrowed, insurance costs around 1,000 euros for every 10 million, for every point 10 million. And that rose to 6,000 in um, 2011. And this just shows that there's even less faith in the country. And speculation and such can just cause this to get worse and worse and worse. And if a country, if people start losing faith in a country, it can lead to um, financial institutions just to stop lending to them. If they think that it's not worth the risk, it's not worth the high credit default swap cost, if they do default, um, what's the likelihood of being repaid? And so this can lead to um, just uh, institutions to stop lending to Greece altogether. As I said several times, if this happens, their economy just can't survive. Their government can't borrow money. Um, they just can't carry on where they are. And, um, I'll go into that a bit later about their government's actual spending and the problems inherently within Greece. But I'll go into that a bit later. Um, now, one of the big issues with Greece around late 2010, um, as well as their government debt becoming um, less viable to, for investors to borrow and to lend money to the country, um, their economy was actually still shrinking. Now, in 2010, all but two countries, Greece and one other, I can't remember which, were experiencing um, positive GDP growth in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Now, Greece at this time was still experiencing, their economy was still shrinking at around 1.2%. That doesn't seem like much, but it's just the fact that their deficit's at 15%, their debt's over 100%, and yet they're still shrinking as an economy, which just shows that there doesn't really seem like a way back. And this is in early 2010 where no measures have really been introduced, no measures have been even suggested to solve the problem in Greece. And yet, just looking at the figures, you can see that there doesn't seem like any way that Greece can help sort, um, sort their own problems out because of their shrinking economy, which means they're less able to, less tax revenues, which means their government has less money to repay, which means they have to borrow even more. 
and the situation just, as I said, vicious cycle just gets worse and worse. So, and in, in May 2010, this is, the, this is the first time anything is done about Greece and the euro and their problems. And here, the IMF introduced a safety net of 22 billion euros. Now, to me, this seems almost laughable, this amount, because you think about the 20, obviously, hindsight, beautiful thing, but 22 billion euros as a safety net for Greece, when you think that now the um, Europe's leaders have suggested raising the equivalent of that now to 1 trillion euros. So when you think 22 billion compared to a trillion, it just shows that they didn't have any grasp of the severity of the situation and the problems Greece were in, and how a problem in Greece could lead to severe issues elsewhere in Europe. So just for the IMF to even suggest 22 billion just shows how little they knew and how, how much they thought that Greece either, they didn't realise that Greece was such a problem and that they were unable to solve their own problems, or they didn't realise the negative consequences of Greece defaulting and the problems that would have outside, or within Europe and beyond. Now, um, in later in 2010, October, there was the first real EU summit that addressed the problems within Greece. And this again, this is just very surprising because it's only a year, last year, a um, year ago from now, that they started discussing what to do. And yet, the problems in Greece have been going on since they joined the EU. It just shows that because nothing was done, their problems were allowed to get worse. They delayed for 15 years before even doing anything serious. It just shows that perhaps something could have been done if it was dealt with in the early, to, um, early of the new century or the last decade. Then um, something perhaps could have been done about it, but the fact they left it so late and they either didn't realise the the situation or just didn't appreciate it shows that the, e the Europe leaders, well, they could have done something about it, potentially, if they brought in earlier measures. But at this conference, it was the first sort of response to the EU, as I said, and this is where the European Stability Mechanism was brought in of 110 billion euro, uh, sorry, 440 billion euros, 110 of which would go to Greece in various instalments to help them not default on their loans. And so this was the first sign that Europe's leaders were sort of actually doing something directly about Greece. As I said, as it's only a year ago, it seems quite that they were just delaying for no apparent reason to help sort, to sort out the problems in Greece and just allowing them to get worse and worse to the point where they had to deal with it or crisis would follow. And um, although I'm being quite negative, it does show, however, that they're now doing something about it. And they're not just allowing it to carry on, not just allowing Greece to fall. They're realising that something needs to be done. And they're not just allowing Greece to default and potentially leave the euro. Because, as I said earlier, um, that was quite a... Well, it was, no one even thought that could happen. That was sort of a taboo that was not even mentioned, that a country could leave the euro. This monetary policy union that was brought in, the sort of culmination of years and years of political union after the Second World War in Europe. So for a country to leave the euro would be sort of the, a big sign of it failing, essentially. And so this wasn't even a thought in the Europe's leaders' minds at this point in uh, late 2010. Um, now this, as I said, the 110 billion that went straight to Greece in instalments, this was sort of announced in early 2011 that it hadn't worked, that Greece's problems hadn't been solved. And this doesn't really seem uh, surprising that simply throwing money it's an economy that's failing, doesn't sort it out when you haven't solved the inherent problems. They didn't try, they didn't um, impose any sanctions on Greece, so they had to solve their austerity measures, uh, they had to impose austerity measures to solve their fiscal deficit or to lower their government debt as a consequence. They sort of gave the 110 billion in various instalments and basically hoped that it would sort itself out the Greek economy. Yeah. Do European leaders actually think it would work? Do you think? I'd like to think so. Okay. Um, it seems to say putting that amount of money into a country, although looking at it, you can see how do they think it was going to work. Putting 110 billion into an economy that's fiscal deficit 15% on a debt that's by this time over 300 billion euros, 
even if they repay that straight away, it's not going to, even if they put all that into repaying their loans, that's not going to solve the inherent problems that exist of the fiscal deficit, and they'll just keep growing on their uh, growing debt each and every year. See, I don't know what would happen if we completely just left Greece to just die. But do you think that, don't you think we There's could... a quite interesting blog by a smart fellow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but don't you think that the, uh, the only reason you bail out a country initially is because you think that what you're spending on the bailout is worth more than what would happen if you didn't do Yeah, that. that's, that's exactly but, the point. Yeah. But if you, con- if you continue to bail out an economy for, for a long period of time, the total sum of the amount you're spending when will the cost of just letting groups die initially in last yeah. year outweigh, I mean, be less than the cost of yeah, that com- yeah, that comes in later with Germany and especially Merkel, um, essentially saying how um, this comes in about halfway through this year, um, where the first calls were for Greece to actually be allowed to leave the euro, uh, in some ways be forced, um, not directly but indirectly through the stopping the bailout. Um, and the call came from Germany, as I said, Basically, they said that it was no longer worth it and no longer fair for Europe's taxpayers to have to bail out Greece's economy, especially as Greece was doing little about it. And this is the first time that kind of a country leaving the euro was ever mentioned. And that in itself shows the severity of the situation, the fact that they're actually suggesting for a country to leave. Mm-hmm. And they were saying how the taxpayers, it's not worth it anymore. Like, bailing out Greece, it's not worth it if they default we'd be better off letting them default than just continuing throwing money at the lost situation. Because the taxpayer now have to be absorbing more of what yeah. they might have been The problem is, exactly, yeah. So, I just I don't know, this might be the best time to just leave Greece alone. Yeah, rather than now. continue putting yeah, money out, yeah. exactly, yeah. trying, to get, um, trying to get hundreds of billions from various places, including China, trying to increase the um, EFSF to one trillion. It just seems that you've got to balance that, why not let Greece default? And I'm sure there's a reason somewhere why you can't just let Greece out. Mm. Yeah, it's well, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> I know. It I gets know. very complicated. <laughs> yeah, I know. Letting them go back to the drama causes yeah. lots of problems, but I'll talk about that later. How credible do you think the knock on effects are? Because I think most people are assuming now you let Greece go, Italy will follow with that, then it will be Spain, then it will be Portugal. So, as you said at, at the start, this is not a sort of problem confined to Greece, isn't it? It's something affecting the euro. So, yeah. surely, don't you think that just leaving Greece on their own, they'll end up pulling everyone down with mm, them? That's why. And then that's, even France will go down at the end of it. You no, know. that's one of the biggest reasons for continuing the bailout. They're worried. No one really knows, or certainly not Europe's leaders know, what happens if Greece goes. Would the following aftermath um, be severe enough to drag down, as you said, Italy? which is a big worry, but even though it's not necessarily Italy, the economy is big as Italy, perhaps just the outlying southern states like Spain, Portugal, maybe Ireland as well. And if it were to drag those down, would it cause to an eventual, um, possibly even a complete breakup of the euro? But no one's really able to judge just to what extent um, Greece defaulting and leaving the euro would cause any other countries to follow suit. And that's why the are on the side of caution at the moment I believe, because it's better to continue the bailout now without knowing the full risks. Because as um, Kingsley said, why bother putting more money in when it outweighs the cost of Greece defaulting? That's not when they don't know what the cost would be of Greece defaulting. And despite some calls that maybe if they'd put this money into strengthening the banks and strengthening the other countries and just letting Greece go and concentrating on making sure it doesn't cause any other other countries to default. Maybe it had been more wise to just let that happen and focus on strengthening other countries. But the whole point, they don't know how much that would take to ensure that Spain and Portugal don't default. They're not sure how much that would cost in the aftermath of a Greece Greek default. So it's quite a difficult situation to gauge. Do we continue bailing Greece out and ensuring they don't default? Or do we simply ensure ourselves against that happening and be prepared for it. So it's quite a difficult situation to weigh up. The it's quite, it's quite it. hard to see quite hard to weigh up the costs yeah. of this and that. So just throwing money in and have the yeah. the costs of a lot of people having money in front of you. Yeah, um back to the <laughs> um, so yeah, as I said, in the early 20, 2011, it was announced that the oh, okay. um, <laughs> 
the 110 billion euro bailout hadn't worked. And by now, the sovereign debt had reached 160% of GDP, which is astronomical when you think that the target was 60%. So they've let it get to 160% despite bailouts occurring. And this just shows that something more severe has to be done. Um, and I'll skip a bunch because it's already half past. I don't want to keep it too long. But um, I'll now go on to um, the really recent um, thing, uh, events in Greece and how it led to the sort of three pronged attack by Merkozy and the other European leaders. So Merkel and Sarkozy, that's just a nickname, yeah. That's a nickname in the um, So yeah, um, recently the EU summit that occurred in just the last month, um, they were focused really on three things that had to be done. The first of which was dealing with Greece and any possible debt restructuring which occurred. I'll explain these later. Debt restructuring which occurred. Second was boosting the European Financial Stability Facility, which is essentially a permanent bailout fund for any countries to one, uh, a trillion euros from 440 billion. And the third was recapitalising the banks. Um, now the first, debt restructuring within Greece. Now debt restructuring essentially, you might have heard like this phrase, debt restructuring or a haircut for the banks. And, things. and this is basically where they, in a way, force Europe's banks and any banks holding Greek debt to get rid of a certain portion of this debt and not cause Greece to have to repay it. Because around half of Greece's debt is um, within banks in Europe. And so obviously causing them to write off a lot of this debt would be a, good, a great step to reducing Greece's level of debt. And the numbers were, I think, the banks within Europe, they were moderately helping this situation. They knew something had to be done. Because after all, getting repaid half of something is better than getting all of nothing. And um, so they proposed 40% of all their debts held by Greece to be written off. We think just in, um, sort of just in the banks within Germany and France, they held three, uh, 300 billion euros of Greek debt by this time, by now. They have 300 billion euros of exposure to um, Greek debt. So writing off 40% of this is quite a substantial amount. Now Europe's leaders were calling for 60%, so quite democratically they met in the middle, and it was decided on 50% haircut. So Greece's, overall Greece's debts were cut, would be cut from, I think it would reduce their national debt from 160% to 120 Now this is going a long way to solving problems, but by no means is it solving them because 120% of GDP is still a phenomenal amount. Now, um, the second point, the boosting the financial stability facility to a trillion, the whole point of this is uh, to enable any uh, continued bailout within Greece and to prove to markets that, they, that the Europe's leaders can deal with the situation, can deal with the problem. And now, the way they were trying to raise, these, raise this money um, in my, um, one of the places was from China, trying to get um, from, well, not just China, but emerging countries such as Russia and China and a few others. Um, they were trying to get around 150 billion euros from China to contribute. Um, now, I'm not going to go into this decision too much, but this would be quite a risky move. Now, on some level, China would um, want to provide this money because their largest trading base is in the EU. So if the EU were to fail, then they'd be in severe problems. But also, to some extent, they're perfectly justified to say, this is your problem, you sort it out. Because why should they have to um, bail out a country that they're not necessarily involved in, and they've got themselves into problems? And if they were to provide this 150 billion euros, or a figure close to it, it would undoubtedly come with huge ramifications, with massive interest rates for the Europe to have to repay. So that, in some respects, isn't worth it, going down that route. And then the rest of the trillion is made up from taxpayers' revenue and other contributions throughout Europe and various places. Then the third task of the summit was to um, uh, um, recapitalising Europe's banks to 10%. And this basically means for every thousand pounds, or uh, thousand euros, they have um, loaned out to people, they have a hundred of it, well another hundred euros in their vaults, in their deposits, as real capital, 
And this is basically just strengthening the banks to any possible default by Greece. If it, cause if it were to occur, especially banks within Greece, um, they, several of them would not be able to cope with a Greek default and not re repaying their loans. And so this is essentially to strengthen your banks so that if any Greek default were to occur, it wouldn't lead to financial crisis within uh, Europe's banks. And on the whole, um, this seems to be quite successful, these three measures. Uh, markets responded quite well, stock exchanges were rising, and it seemed like there was sort of hope on the horizon for Greece, that there was a way out now. But then uh, Papandreou decided to step in and um, call for a referendum on these um, measures that were being brought in, because the consequence of this, um, Europe obviously weren't just giving money to Greece, they were obviously having to respond <coughs> with austerity measures, um, such as ta um, tax raises, raising the retirement age, and you might have seen the huge um, protests in Athens and various other cities in Greece to these austerity measures. So Papandreou decided to call for a referendum, and this caused outrage in the markets. He was um, called up in the G20 and basically Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy, the leaders of, or well, the representatives of Germany and France at the G20, essentially tore a strip off him. They, yeah, they gave a bit of a telling off about for this and um, quite severely because all the work that had gone into this and settling the markets and just continuing the Greek bailout they had basically thrown it back in their faces by saying, I'm going to let my people decide, not you. And I'm sort of going to leave it there for now because um, I'm going to leave it with Papandreou calling for the referendum. Obviously, a lot of things have happened since then. Well, not a lot, but a few. And I would have talked about Italy, but it's getting on, on a bit. So, like, questions. One important point about Italy. What would one important point about Italy? Alright, um, okay, very good for Italy. Um, they're the third biggest economy in Europe and they have huge levels of debt, uh, 120% of their GDP, I think it was, of their debt. But more importantly, I think the most significant thing going on in Italy, besides their idiot of a leader, Silvio Berlusconi, um, not doing anything about their country's problems, is their bond markets, their bonds government bonds, they've now been increased to six, uh, above the 6% interest level. And the significance of this is when this happened in Italy, uh, no, sorry, when this happened in Ireland, Portugal and Spain, when their bonds became, uh, their interests on their bonds went above 6%, this is what triggered Europe's um, bailout in those countries. And now Italy has gone to this level. So within the next few weeks, it's going to be very interesting to see what involvement um, the bailout mechanism will have in Italy, if any. Do you think we should move on then from this experiment effectively of having economies interconnected in this way but still having political sovereigns mm -hmm. over their own affairs? Do you think we should actually move on from the experiment and try and yeah. go back to having individual currencies is effectively what I'm asking? I think um, with the euro it's more all or nothing. They've tried to do sort of a half assed job of it. They've brought in the monetary policy union and the economic union, but they haven't brought in any of the politics, or any of the necessary politics involved with something like bringing in the euro, which is massive. When you think about countries in Greece being allowed to continue their fiscal spending, but having the interest rates and the exchange rates are the same as Germany, it seems a bit absurd that they're allowed to continue their spending despite this. So, I'm not saying this will lead to Europe, I don't think this will lead to um, Europe breaking up, but um, if Greece does go, it will certainly will send out a message that something needs to change within the Euro. Either greater um, political union and more controls over a country's individual economies and their fiscal spending, or it will lead to several other countries um, being removed and almost starting afresh with a few of the base, um, more risk-free countries building a stronger union and slowly integrating how they almost should have done in the first place, slowly integrating other countries into it.
Well, the haircuts, like the 50%, 100% are safe, as it were, so surely it could have brought some of the banks down and caused it to um, Well, yeah, this was a big point made because the 50% level, when the 50% was first um, suggested, the banks turned around and said, well, if you initiate 50% haircut, we'll say that this is essentially the same as a default and they'd trigger their credit default swaps because they'd say it's an involuntary haircut and involuntary restructuring therefore they can um, they're within their rights to trigger these credit default swaps and if those occurred basically pretty much every year would stop lending to Greece if the banks had to trigger these on all their Greek debt so that was the controversy around the um, banks having to write off a lot of their Greek debt essentially with every crisis, you know, you always say that we, you can't believe why we missed out on something or why we didn't mm. see this coming. With a recession, the biggest thing we didn't see coming was the housing bubble. What do you think the biggest thing, or the most obvious thing that you think the leaders missed out on? Was it Greek split? Well, was it I think, well, the big difference, I think, is this seems a lot more obvious than the financial crisis because although there were signs of the financial crisis and there were definite signs now that we can see trends in the housing market, why did no one know this was a bubble? But, or rather, why did no one react to thinking this was a bubble? Um, <coughs> that was relatively sudden, the 2008 financial crisis. Whereas this hasn't officially turned into a crisis yet because it's still being bailed out. It's still effectively safe. There's still things being done about it. Um, it's still being effectively controlled by Europe's leaders. However, it's still been building up for 15, like I said, for 15 years. Uh, Greece has been allowed to maintain its policy of fiscal spending. And just the fact that they, frankly, they shouldn't have been allowed in the euro in the first place. They shouldn't have been. They should have stayed with the track mark. They should have been forced to stay with the track mark until they'd tackled some of their um, fiscal spending problems and the underlying issues. But um, yeah, well, I think that just Europe's leaders, they should have seen that with that amount of spending and the fact that they have the interest rates and exchange rates of Germany, they just can't continue. At some point, it would become that they can't repay their debts and. They should have seen that. The fact that that amount of spending can't be maintained. Yeah. You said it wasn't a crisis yet. How long do you think it'll be into a couple of weeks? Months? Well, you can't say. If, hopefully, it won't. Yeah. Hopefully, this What's these three um, policies brought in will keep the euro, uh, keep Greece strong, and maintain them. And then the austerity measures, which look likely to be brought in now with the new government, um, look likely to be brought in. So hopefully Greece will start to be on the right track. It will take years and years before they're ever a strong economy again. But um, if Greece defaulted, then it would certainly turn into a crisis and potentially, like Tom suggested, drag down Spain, Portugal, Ireland, the other weaker European countries. And this would be because if Greece defaulted, then countries would instantly um, begin finding it harder and harder to borrow money from lenders because of the uncertainty in the um, sovereign debt market, uh, sovereign bond market. <laughs> no. Right, do you think if countries like Germany are going to refuse to go back to their old currencies, do you think they should have two levels of the euro? So they should have some weak countries in like a one where, which means that they can have like a weak currency to export the market and then have like all the strong countries in the, like a, a different and you still have the euro. Um, yeah, I think that could work. The stronger current, uh, the stronger countries, sort of maintaining and holding up the euro, whilst the weaker countries are able to still have strong exports. But the underlying problems really are that it was all rushed in, and there's no, there's still no political union. That's one of the big problems. The fact that countries are allowed to spend and spend and spend. And they're not allowed to, there's no controls on that within the Central um, European Union. And in fact, they're bringing in these monetary policy and the currencies, even with two tiers of the euro, it still wouldn't change the fact that countries are allowed to spend and spend and spend. And that would drag down.